Hi everyone, this is Dr. G. Amarindar Rao, Department of Mechanical Engineering, Vijnan Bharti Institute of Technology, Hyderabad. In today's session, uh, we will be discussing about unsteady heat conduction systems. In unsteady heat conduction systems, time becomes an important variable in addition to the spatial coordinates. Thus, it's also called as time dependent conduction or transient heat conduction. In many engineering applications, we come across systems involving unsteady heat conduction. To name a few of them, cooling of uh, cylinders of internal combustion engines, heat treatment processes like quenching, annealing, thermal storage systems, and so on. Broadly, unsteady systems can be classified into two types. First is periodic unsteady systems. The next one is non-periodic unsteady systems. As the name implies, in periodic unsteady systems, temperature would be a periodic function of time. This temperature varies periodically with respect to time as depicted below. It could be a sine function or a cosine function. We can see here that on the x-axis we have time, y-axis we have temperature, which is fluctuating between two limits, minimum and maximum limits, and there is a mean temperature. And you can see temperature is continuously going up and down, up and down. And another salient observation can be made from this figure is that a given temperature can be recorded again and again after a definite period of time. For example, I am interested in this temperature. I can get it at this instant, at this instant, at this instant and so on. For example, in the operation of uh, an internal combustion engine, you want to know the temperature of the cylinder walls say during compression process at some location let us say some 30 degrees before top dead center right that may be your emphasis definitely you can do it definitely you can do it since there is something certain about temperature time relation periodic unsteady systems are also called as quasi steady systems Quasi steady means almost steady, but not really steady. So, quasi steady and periodic uh, unsteady systems carry the same sense. On the other side, in non periodic unsteady systems, temperature either increases or decreases continuously with respect to time, as shown over here. The first curve, red color one, shows the cooling process. And uh, the galaxy color shows the heating process. You can see that temperature is continuously decreasing or increasing with respect to time. Uh, you are going to get a particular temperature once for all, either it is during cooling or during heating. And we can have non periodic unsteady systems classified into three more categories depending upon the relative magnitudes of internal thermal resistance and surface thermal resistance. To get a gauge of this internal and surface thermal resistances, let us pick up any non-periodic unsteady systems made up of some material having thermal conductivity K exposed to a medium of a convective heat transfer coefficient H. Let's pick up three points P, the hottest point inside the solid, Q on the surface or inside the fluid. And uh, temperature at P is higher than temperature at Q followed by temperature at R so that we are going to experience unsteady conduction inside from P to Q at the rate of Q tau and unsteady convection at the rate of Q1 tau from Q to R. 
then if you represent the unlock circuit diagram this is the potential highest potential this is the lowest potential between p and q you got conduction and the magnitude of the sun steady conduction is hampered by internal resistance between q and r on the surface you have uh, unsteady convection which is resisted by surface resistance then as per the ohm's law inside conduction is given by tp minus tq by r internal in watts and the outside convection is tq minus tr by r surface and you can see that the conduction and convection heat transfer rates for the given temperature difference exclusively depend upon these two resistances and nomenclature already we have discussed q tau is unsteady conduction inside from p to q and as you are aware conduction is an internal mechanism and r int is internal thermal resistance or conductive resistance which is mathematically given by l by k where l is any linear dimension between p and q a is the area available for heat transfer and k is the thermal conductivity of the selected material then q1 tau is the unsteady convection from q to r which is surface phenomenon and r is you are the surface resistance or convective resistance which is mathematically given by uh, 1 by h a a is the area available for heat transfer h is the convective heat transfer coefficient now depending upon the relative magnitudes i am talking about relative magnitudes of these two resistances one can have three categories of non periodic unsteady systems first one systems with negligible internal resistance second one systems with negligible surface resistance and third one systems with both the resistances comparable equivalent if you look at the first one analysis of systems with negligible internal resistance mathematically speaking our internal extremely small compared to our surface for this to happen k of the material has to be extremely high theoretically it has to be infinite and h of the medium should be finite so both these criteria must be satisfied to make sure that our internal is extremely small compared to our surface since k is infinite the material will become a perfect conductor no temperature drop inside as a result points p and q will merge together tp is same as t q and down the line we are going to show that when you put forth these conditions a uh, bat number is going to be extremely small compared to 1 and uh, as a result of this we are going to have only one resistance that surface resistance because h is finite and if you show this situation for a simple plane wall unsteady plane wall a made up of material having thermal diffusivity alpha steady state conduction we talk about k unsteady conduction we talk about alpha and we are going to ventilate the concept of uh, uh, alpha a little later and you can see that initially the entire system is at ti inside the moment you go to the surface it will drop down to t infinity after some period of time the temperature of the entire system is sliding down to t1 when you go to the surface it will go down to uh, t infinity fluid temperature and so on uh, which means that temperature will be same everywhere temperature is a function of only time it does not vary with the location this makes systems with negligible internal resistance relatively simple mathematically amicable so systems with negligible internal thermal resistance as i was telling temperature would be a function of time alone thus a given system of any geometry could be a plate it could be a wire or sphere or any casting may be replaced by a simple lump 
as a result of uh, this you call these systems also as lumbered heat capacity systems which means that the entire energy of the system is uh, replaced by represented by a single dot or a lump and analysis of these systems would be simple as it involves only one variable time location does not matter practically thin metallic plates thin wires thin castings thermocouples are some of the systems which belong to this category now we re redefine our objective as analysis of lumped systems when i say analysis we want to find temperature at any instant tau that's the idea so for this purpose we pick up a lumped system of surface area of a volume v made up of some material having density rho specific heat c thermal conductivity k initially a tau is equal to zero the system is a ti this we call it as ic initial condition and exposed to a medium of h comma t infinity at any instant tau the entire system is at some temperature t and system will be losing heat to the medium at a rate of q tau by convection and here rho c k are known as thermophysical properties rho is density c is specific heat k is thermal conductivity a and v are known as geometrical properties at any instant at any instant uh, q tau the instantaneous heat transfer rate should be equal to heat lost by the system by convection which should be equal to decrease in energy of the system if you make it mathematical q tau is equal to h a t minus t infinity times rho c v d t by d tau and we put a negative sign to incorporate the fact that heat is going away this negative sign is also uh, introduced to take care of the fact that as the time is increased temperature is de decreasing therefore dt by d tau is always negative as a result we are putting a negative sign uh, in the newton's law of cooling and this equation is known as the instantaneous energy balance equation here q tau represents the instantaneous heat transfer rate in watts t is instantaneous temperature at the selected time tau in degree centigrade dt by d tau represents the rate of change of temperature at any tau and dt by d tau is going to be negative if ti is more than t infinity heat is going away dt by d tau is going to be positive if T A is less than T infinity. Heat is coming in. Okay, so we we consider uh, this dt by d tau as an important parameter. Then, if you substitute tau is equal to zero in the energy balance equation, we are going to have Q I zero, that is the initial heat transfer rate, as minus H A T I minus T infinity is equal to rho C V d T by d tau initially at tau is equal to zero uh, this we call it as initial energy balance equation now we can manipulate equation one the instantaneous energy balance equation and uh, we can find the temperature time history as theta by theta i which is t minus t infinity by t i minus t infinity is equal to e power minus h a by rho c v tau yet theta is t minus t infinity which represents instantaneous temperature difference theta i t i minus t infinity is initial temperature difference and this equation 3 can be plotted x axis we take time y axis we take temperature and initially when tau is zero entire system is a ti and subjected to a fluid at a temperature of t infinity and uh, by substituting different times you are going to get a curve which is exponential in nature and at any instant tau 
the system is losing heat <coughs> at a rate of Q tau. Uh, now we will be having two types of issues. First is that find the temperature at any time. Let's say time is three minute. At third minute you want to find the temperature. Simply from here dry vertical till you meet the curve. From there dry horizontal. You are going to get the temperature at that instant. On the other side, you want to find the time required to get any temperature T. I want to get a temperature of, let us say, some 80 degrees centigrade. Initial temperature is 150, let us suppose. <clears throat> then how long you have to wait to get this temperature? Simply do the reverse. Dry a horizontal till you meet the curve. From there, dry a vertical. Nothing more than that. Now, at this juncture, we introduce uh, the concepts of BI and FO where BI is equal to HLC by K is known as the famous Bayat number. FO is alpha tau by LC square is known as the Fourier number. Here we introduce all these parameters. H already we know, convective heat transfer coefficient. <coughs> K is also known to us, thermal conductivity of the material, tau is the time. Down the line we'll introduce alpha and LC. Uh, for this purpose, we take the power HA by rho C V tau. Uh, then we divide both numerator and denominator by A to get as H tau by rho C V by A. That's going to be HA by rho C LC. Where LC is V by A, which is known as the characteristic length in meters, which is simply the ratio of volume of the system by its surface area. If you look at the expressions for LC for some of the simple geometries, thin plates if you take, I got a thin plate of thickness L, area A, left side area A, right side area A. Total area available to the fluid is 2A, volume is A into L. And if you simplify, it's going to be L by 2. So LC for thin plates will be semi thickness of the plate. If you got a plate of 2 cm thickness, LC will be 1 cm. Because of uh, <coughs> this particular simplification. If you take long wires, when I say long wire, I mean stretch of the wire, length of the wire is too much compared to the diameter. Then volume will be pi by 4 d square L. Surface area is pi d L. If you simplify it, it's going to be d by 4 or r by 2. So LC will be semi radius of the wire. If I got a wire of 20 mm diameter, 10 mm radius, LC will be 5 mm, which has to be used in the calculation of Bayat number as well as the Fourier number. Then in some mechanical applications, we may come across shallow wires. When I say shallow wire, L and D are comparable. Uh, the diameter of the wire may be 2 cm, L may be 3.5 cm. Nothing much to separate them out. In the case of longer wires, diameter of the wire is 2 cm, alright, but length of the wire may be 5 meters, that is 500 cm. This will be too much compared to the diameter. And uh, physically speaking, when you take a long wire, Area means only the surface area, pi dl. We need not bother about the flat areas. Left side flat area, right side flat area. That is cross section of the wire will be very very small compared to the surface area of the wire. When it is too much compared to d. But uh, when you take shallow wires, you cannot afford to ignore the flat areas. As a result, volume is same, pi by 4 d square L, but surface area will be, total area will be surface area plus two flat areas, left side flat area, right side flat area. That makes shallow wires different from long wires as far as calculation of LC is concerned. And if you simplify this equation, because there are so many commonalities, you are going to get LC as d by 4 plus 2 times d by l 
and if d by l is very very small compared to 1 then d by l can be ignored let us say diameter of the wire is 2 centimeters uh, length of the wire is 500 centimeters and if you calculate this 2 centimeters by 500 centimeters it is going to be extremely small when I say d by l is extremely small it is as good as saying that the flat areas are negligible in that case lc will be very close to d by 4 this will be vanishing okay so this is what exactly we do uh, for shallow wires so you have to look at the relative dimensions of the stretch of the wire and the diameter of the wire if you do it for spheres volume is 4 by 3 pi r cube area is 4 pi r square it's going to be one third of the radius if you make it for cubes of side a volume is a cube total surface area is 6 a square the cube will have six surfaces front back left right top bottom each having an area of a square then lc will be uh, one sixth of the side a by six so by making first manipulation we could able to introduce the concept of characteristic dimension which is simply the ratio of the volume of the lumpur system to the surface area suppose for a casting which is of irregular shape volume is 125 cubic centimeters surface area is say 96 uh, square centimeters then simply find the ratio to get lc as as simple as that by using some other methods uh, you may be given the volume and area for complex mechanical components the next manipulation uh, h tau by rho c l c multiply by k and divide by k thermal conductivity and this you write as k by rho c k by rho c times h tau by k l c and this k by rho c is called as alpha times h tau by k l c this alpha k by l c is known as thermal diffusivity and as you can see that uh, some remarks about alpha which becomes very useful in unsteady conduction it is a material property since it is made up of only properties k rho c remember you have a thumb rule any parameter made up of only properties should be a property next its value for all the materials is available in standard data books quite obvious it represents the ratio of thermal conductivity to thermal capacity of the given material so alpha is thermal conductivity to thermal capacity as you are aware thermal conductivity of a material represents its ability to conduct heat thermal capacity of a material indicates its ability to store the heat therefore the value of alpha indicates relative ability of a material in conducting and storing heat for instance if you got a material some heat is coming in maybe some 500 watts then a part of this energy will be disposed a part of will be stored and how much of this 500 is disposed conducted away and how much is stored depends exclusively on the value of alpha remember there is a scope for storage of energy only in unsteady conduction therefore incoming energy will be partly stored and partly uh, conducted away and the continuation of this a high value of alpha a high value of alpha which happens when k is too much compared to rho c implies more conduction and less storage and the low value of alpha just because of reverse k is very small compared to rho c implies the reverse more storage and less conduction then it is relevant only in unsteady heat conduction where there is a possibility of energy getting stored so second manipulation has given us an important concept of alpha finally uh, we have um, alpha h tau by k l c multiply by rho l c and divide by l c then rearrange this into two useful formats h l c by k is a group one h 
LC by K. Alpha tau by LC square group 2. Alpha tau by LC square. And this first term is called as the famous Biot number. And second term is called as the famous Fourier number. Therefore, the power HEA by rho C V tau of temperature time history can be represented by the product of Biot and Fourier. Therefore, equation 3 now can be written in a normalized way as theta by theta is equal to e power minus b i f o. And this equation becomes very useful in the construction of unsteady conduction charts. And this equation can be plotted dimensionless temperature time history for different geometries, plates, wires and spheres x-axis we have product of biot Fourier, y-axis we have theta by theta i. Uh, when biot into Fourier is 0, theta by theta i will be 1. As you increase these values, uh, temperature is going to decrease. And first graph is for plates, second is for wires, third is for spheres. You can see that in plates the cooling is very sluggish, very slow. And uh, in uh, PS is going to be very brisk, very quick. Somewhere in the middle, you are going to have wires. There is the reason why we go for spherical systems in many of the uh, heat transfer applications. Then why all this? What is the significance of these two dimensionless groups? First, let's have a look at Biot number. First is that it is relevant only in unsteady conduction. Second is that it represents the ratio of internal thermal resistance to uh, the surface thermal resistance. So, biot is R internal by R surface. Then its value is used to identify the type of unsteady systems. When biot number is extremely small, you are going to the first category of system. When biot number is too much compared to one, you will be having the second category. When biot number is very close to 1, you will be having third category. No need to know H, no need to know K, no need to know geometry, no need to know anything material. Simply get the biot number and look at it compared to 1. Is it too much compared to 1? Is it too small compared to 1? Or is it so, uh, same as 1? That's going to determine uh, your methodology. For example, biot number is 0 0.006. You can go for first. Let us say biot number is some 128. It becomes the second. Let us say biot number is some 1.8. It belongs to third category. So you need to know only biot number to know what exactly you need to do. And uh, obviously it must be as low as possible to satisfy the concept of Lumpur systems. And as a matter of general rule, Lumpur system analysis is recommended when biot number is less than 0.1, which means that R internal is less than or equal to one tenth of R surface. Lower the value of biot number, better is the accuracy. These are some of the important ideas about the biot number. Then four year number alpha tau by LC square. It is also relevant in unsteady conduction. Then it is also known as a dimensionless time tau. It represents the rate of penetration of heating and cooling effects across the given depth of a solid. Usually when Fourier number is very high, you are going to have very quick rate of penetration. When Fourier number is small, you are going to have slow rate of penetration. So if you got different system, first system four year number is 1.8, second system four year number is a 3.7, you can always say that penetration is more here compared to here. Doesn't matter what the geometry of the system, doesn't matter what the material, doesn't matter all other things. Simply four year number is uh, sufficient to know what exactly is going to happen. So a high value of four year number indicates quicker rates and a low value of F4 implies the reverse. And it should be as much as possible for accurate response of a system. 
then uh, we will have a look at one of the applications of Lumpur systems that is sensitivity or time response of a thermocouple. As I was mentioning earlier, thermocouples are made up of thin wires having materials of tremendous thermal conductivity. Therefore, thermocouples by all means can be taken as Lumpur systems uh, because you are going to have LC extremely small and K extremely big. As a result, HLC by K will be extremely small. So thermocouples can be considered as Lumpur systems uh, since they are made up of good conductors and would be very thin. A good thermocouple should record the temperature of a fluid as early as possible after it is placed in the fluid. For example, you have a duct through which some fluid is flowing at a temperature of let's say minus 10 degrees centigrade, a refrigerant is flowing. Outside temperature is 30 degrees centigrade. Then you embed a thermocouple to record the temperature of the refrigerant. Then this 30 should become minus 10 as early as possible. Definitely 1 minute is better than 3 minutes. 3 minutes is better than 5 minutes. And this particular thing is known as sensitivity or time response of the given thermocouple. And in order to have a benchmarking of sensitivity, if I say more sensitive, less sensitive, it does not carry any sense in engineering applications. So we like to quantify it. For this purpose, we introduce something called time constant of the thermocouple. Mathematically, time constant of a thermocouple represents the time required for the thermocouple uh, to record 63.2 percentage of the initial temperature difference. And what is the significance of this 63.2? Why not 73.2? Why not some other number? We'll be sure after a while. And for accurate temperature measurement, time constant has to be as less as possible. And to get a mathematical meaning of time constant, we consider the time response curve of a thermocouple once again. X-axis we have time. Uh, Y-axis we have temperature. Initially, the thermocouple is at Ti and the fluid is at T infinity. Initial temperature difference is theta i. As the time progresses, uh, the temperature of thermocouple will keep on reducing. Then this initial temperature difference, uh, we split into two unequal parts. Such that the top part is 63.2 percentage of initial temperature difference by 100.632 theta i. Remaining is uh, 1 minus that 0.368 theta i. And from this division point, we draw a horizontal till you get the curve. From there, we draw a vertical and whatever time we have here represents the time constant. Because time constant, as per the definition, represents the time required for the thermocouple to record 63.2 percentage of the initial temperature difference. Then at tau is equal to tau c, equation 2 becomes theta by theta i is equal to t minus t infinity by t a minus t infinity is equal to e power minus h a by rho c v tau c is equal to the remaining difference 0.368 because theta is equal to 0.368 theta i. Therefore, theta by theta i is 0.368. Incidentally, 0.368 is very close to e power minus 1. To get this e power minus 1, to get this 0.368, we take 0.632, that is 63.2 percentage. Now, we compare the exponential parts of this equation. Then we take log on both the sides. We know that log of e to the power of x is equal to e power x is equal to x. As a result, we are going to have uh, minus h a by rho c v tau is equal to 1 minus h a minus h a by rho c v tau is equal to minus 1. 
therefore ये चीज़ भाई रो C V tau C time constant is equal to one and if you make it upside down tau C time constant for a thermocouple of any geometry would be rho C V by H A and if we substitute the units for all this it's going to be in seconds and we know pretty well that V by A is L C therefore tau C will be rho C L C by H and for long wires it's going to be rho C R by 2 H for spheres rho C R by 3 H and for cubes uh, tau C is rho C A by 6 H name any geometry we can find the uh, time constant usually thermocouples will be in the form of uh, long wires in some special applications it could be in the form of spheres you can always calculate the time constant given everything and one may notice that the nature of this curve depends upon h and diameter of the wire and the curve will become steeper and steeper as h is increased as diameter is reduced for the same diameter h must be as less as possible to make the curve steeper to reduce the time constant therefore a thermocouple used to measure temperature of water will be more accurate than when it is used to measure the temperature of air a thermocouple is going to be more accurate in internal flow force through convection than free convection a thermocouple at the ground floor is going to be more effective than thermocouple at the 10th floor h h is going to be reduced as you go upstairs and in the same medium diameter must be less 20 mm wire is more accurate than 30 mm wire which is more accurate than accurate than 40 mm wire something like that so there are two parameters for the given material uh, that would influence uh, your time constant and hence uh, the accuracy of temperature measurement then we will have a quick look at systems with negligible surface resistance h is tremendous infinity k is finite as a result biot number is going to be too much compared to one and you can see that the surface temperature and fluid temperature are same because h is tremendous therefore you will be having only internal resistance between p and q and you can see that uh, initially the entire system is at t i at some time tau 1 the temperature is fluctuating within but the moment you go to the surface doesn't matter what the time temperature is same as the fluid temperature because there is nothing to separate between the surface and the fluid q and r are same so temperature is varying inside because of finite value of k uh, but not varying on the surface because of infinite value of h nevertheless temperature would be a function of x at any time would be a function of time at any location look at tau 1 it is varying from location to location or if you look at location it is varying from time to time this makes the situation very clumsy it's as good as 2d heat conduction the governing differential equation can be taken from the general heat conduction equation x conduction is equal to unsteadiness del square t by del x square is equal to 1 by alpha del t by delta then you can incorporate the boundary conditions x is equal to 0 ts is t infinity theta is 0 and same is at x is equal to l initial condition tau is equal to 0 theta is equal to theta i then we look at the final solution for uh, a couple of cases having physical significance infinite walls a wall having some thickness l but y and z dimensions are very very big initially the entire system is at ti you have some initial temperature difference theta i then at any instant tau uh, temperature is varying with respect to x as well as time then by using variable separable method by using standard mathematics uh, you can find temperature distribution as uh, given by this 4 by pi sigma n is equal to 1 3 5 7 and so on 1 by n sin n pi x by l 
e power minus n pi by l whole square alpha tau. If you look at some of the important remarks about this equation, uh, first one is that the solution for temperature distribution is in the form of an infinite series valid only for odd values of n. For even values, it gets lost. And temperature varies sinusoidally with respect to location and exponentially with respect to time. Then due to the exponential function, the solution converges very quickly. Thus, we never need to go beyond n is equal to 5. So n is equal to 1, you get some accuracy. n is equal to 3, you get more accuracy. And you get to realize that when you put n is equal to 5, you are going to get reasonably good accuracy. So these are some of the remarks about this equation. Then we'll have a quick look at the case B, semi-infinite plates. Semi-infinite plates, when I say, in addition to y and z dimensions being very large, x dimension is also very large. As a result, we are having only one surface, x is equal to 0, where theta is equal to theta i, where theta is equal to theta i, at tau is equal to 0, and theta is equal to 0, at x is equal to 0. Only one boundary condition, one initial condition, second boundary condition is gone. Therefore, this equation becomes very difficult to solve by conventional methods. And uh, the solution for this, approximate solution for this is given by theta x comma tau by theta i, which is tx comma tau minus t infinity by ta minus t infinity is equal to erf eta where ERF eta is known as the error function introduced by Gauss. As a result, we call it as Gauss error function, which is mathematically given by 2 by root by integral 0 to eta e power eta squared d eta. And error function varies between 0 and 1. And eta is known as error variable, which is given by x by 2 root alpha tau. And error variable varies from 0 to 3.6 typically. And Gauss himself has solved this integration by some numerical methods and he has given the results in the form of error function table, which is very much available in standard heat and mass transfer data books. When error function is, uh, when error variable is 0, error function is 0. When error variable is 3.6, error function is 1. In the middle, for all the values of error functions, error variables are furnished. Some of the typical values are given here. You can see when error variable is 2.5, error function is almost, almost 1.99, which means that it's going to approach 1 very quickly. And this table is also available as error function chart error variable on the x axis y axis error function on the x axis which is varying from 0 to 3.6 and error variable is varying from 0 to 1 uh, you can you can see that uh, when it is 3.6 it is almost 1 when it is 0 it is 0 in fact uh, this is error uh, function and this fellow is error variable exactly reverse upside down x axis error variable y axis error function so when error variable is 0 error function is 0 when error variable is 3.6 error function is 1 and you can take any values of error variables you can get the corresponding error function and we'll have two types of problems one is fw problem where eta is given you need to get erf eta when you say eta is given, x and tau are given. Find the temperature at 20 centimeters from the surface after one and a half minute. That is after 150 seconds. After two and a half minutes, some time you can take. Material anyway is given. So eta is x by 2 root alpha tau available to us. Uh, then go upstairs till you meet the curve. Dry horizontal, you get error function. 
Once you have error function, you can always find the temperature T minus T infinity by T A minus T infinity is equal to ERF or uh, ERF eta, right? This is available. Initial temperature is there. Fluid temperature is there. Material is available. And reverse, you can have two problems, backward problems. Error function is given. Temperature is available. So temperature is some 90 degrees. You can always get ERF eta. That is, you got y-axis. Then dry horizontal till you meet the curve. From there, dry vertical, you get error variable. Then error variable is available, which is x by 2 root alpha tau. If x is given, get time. If time is given, get x. If you are permitted to use error function tables or charts, the semi-infinite solids can be easily addressed. Then finally, we look at systems with the, both the resistances comparable or internal very close to our surface. K and H are finite. By at number, will be wavering about 1. You can see internal resistance is there, surface resistance is there. Then temperature is varying inside at any time because of finite value of K. It is varying on the surface because of finite value of H. GD remains the same, governing differential equation. Absolutely no boundary conditions. Only initial condition is there. Therefore, analytical solutions will become very tedious. As a result, chart solutions are recommended to address these type of problems. Heisler charts are popularly used to predict the temperature. And Grober charts are used to estimate the heat transfer rates. And both the Heisler and the Grober charts are available for all the geometries, plates, cylinders, and spheres. So if you are allowed to use uh, these charts, you can always work out to get uh, the temperature or the heat transfer rate. Now let us uh, try to look at uh, some numericals appeared in the previous engineering services. First problem, steel balls of 12 mm diameter are annealed at 800 degrees centigrade and then slowly cooled to 127 degrees centigrade in air at 50 degrees centigrade with H is equal to 20. Calculate the time required for the cooling process. Properties of steel are K45, rho is 7830, C is 600 in respective units, which appeared about two decades back for 20 marks. So you got a steel ball, something like this, of some radius. First of all, you have to generate the data, data interpretation. Then you have to have the data in consistent form. Diameter 12 mm, radius 6 mm by 1006 into 10 power minus 3 meters. Ti 800, T infinity 50, H20, T127, how much is tau? Thermophysical properties are available. Then first find the Bayat number to know whether it is a lump pole system or not. If we calculate Bayat number, which is going to be HR by 3K, 8.888 10 power minus 4, which is extremely small compared to 1. Therefore, uh, you can take it as a lump pole system. And for lump pole systems, we know the temperature time history. For spheres, it becomes T minus T infinity by T A minus T infinity is equal to E power minus 3 H tau by rho CR. Everything is available except tau. Calculate. It is going to be 1069.6 seconds, which is about 17.82 minutes. Second problem which appeared in uh, ESE 2008 for 10 marks. A copper sphere weighing 3 kgs is heated in a furnace to a temperature of 300 and is suddenly taken out and allowed to cool in ambient air to 25 degrees centigrade. It takes 60 minutes for the copper sphere to cool to 35 degrees centigrade. Determine the convective heat transfer coefficient for air. Properties of copper are given, K385, density 8950, specific 383. This appeared in ESE 2008 for 10 marks. Then if you jot down the data, only thing is that instead of giving the radius of the sphere, he has given the mass. Instead of uh, giving H, he has given both temperature and time. You have only one unknown. That unknown is H. We know pretty well that density is mass per unit volume. <clears throat> volume will be mass by density. 
mass is 3 kg, density is 1850, volume becomes 3.351 10 power minus 4 meter cube. For SPR, we know that volume is 4 by 3 pi r cube. Volume is available, therefore you can find the radius of the sphere 0 0.043 meters. Then uh, T minus T infinity by T A minus T infinity is equal to E power minus 3 H tau by rho C R. We have everything but H. And if you simplify, you are going to get H as 45.23 watts per meter square Kelvin. And you do back calculation to confirm the fact that this equation is authentic. Simply calculate by at number with the available value of H. It is going to be 0 0.00165. Therefore, uh, whatever procedure you adopted is correct. Then we look at another problem. Uh, stainless steel balls, ball bearings of 1.2 cm diameter are to be quenched in water. The balls leave the oven at 900 and are exposed to air at 30 for a while before they are dropped into water. The temperature of the bearings not to fall below 850 prior to quenching and heat transfer coefficient in air is 125. Determine how long they can stand in the air before being dropped into the water. Properties of stainless steel are K15.21 rho 8085C480. And alpha is also given 3.91 10 power minus 6. Then data you can always take it and have it in consistent form and uh, you have everything simply calculate the time required which is going to be 3.677 seconds these are some of the problems which appeared in the previous ESE so with this we conclude this and I believe that these contents will be of immense use to all the aspirants of uh, NSM exams as well as various competitive examinations so with this we close the session and uh, take care of yourself. Have a good time ahead of you. Thank you.